Newsmaker Saturday starts now. Thanks for joining us on Newsmaker Saturday. President Trump has a word for it. He calls it a crisis at our southern border, a flood of Central Americans coming across our border. Many families, women and children, unaccompanied minors seeking asylum. Apprehensions through February. These are the facts are up 300 percent from last year. And we are seeing this here in Arizona. Since December 21st, according to data, ICE has released 84,500 migrant family members. 15,000 have been released in the Phoenix area. Many dropped off at the Greyhound bus station. Henry Lucero is the Phoenix field director for ICE. He is my first guest this week on Newsmaker Saturday. Great to see you. Thank you for having me. It's a daunting job. You've been doing this 20, 21 years. Have you seen it like this before? It used to be Mexican nationals, now it's Central Americans. That's correct. I have seen volume this high, but not with Central Americans, and definitely not the number of families that are crossing the border illegally. And that presents a, a completely different challenge to your agency, right? Absolutely. So when uh, the busy time, maybe 10 to 15 years ago, when the majority were Mexican nationals, they could be repatriated to their home countries immediately. They never came to ICE for detention. Uh, and to go through the process. So this has ca caused a major strain on our operations. Do you believe that some of this is by design? That in other words, the word is out in Central America, come now, because with these kind of numbers, they can't handle all this. I absolutely believe it's by design that uh, information that we've obtained from interviewing people, um, they're being told if you come with a child or children, there's a high likely, likelihood you will be released. You will only spend a few days with the Border Patrol, uh, generally only hours for ICE, and you'll be released into the community. What do you do, just give me the law here, if they get to the wall and they touch that wall, are they considered on American soil? Um, once they get over the wall or under over the, the wall, wall or around the wall, when they make entry on U.S. soil, then they're here and then they'll be uh, arrested. These people are not evading custody. They are getting over or around the wall somehow and then uh, waiting to be apprehended by the Border Patrol. Okay, so they are they're coming across and saying, take me, I'm yours. And, and they, know, they know the system? They've been told what they believe the system is going to do, which is process them, uh, give them paperwork that tells them they have to go to a court hearing at some point in the future, and that ultimately they'll be released uh, until they go through their, their process, as some, long as they're coming with the child. Some with electronic monitoring to track their movement, others not. How do you determine who gets electronic monitoring? Uh, it used to be a case-by-case -case basis on the information we actually had on the individuals, if they were derogatory information. Now it's really uh, a supply and demand. We have less ankle braces than we have people that need them. So if we have them in their, our inventory, ankle bracelets are being placed on them, but we run out frequently. The statistics, I believe, the best I've been able to find is that 80%, 80% do not show up for their court hearing. Um, I don't have the particular uh, percentage, but what I can tell you, uh, when they do have an ankle bracelet, they're uh, more likely to comply. I mean, there's sometimes when people cut them off, which is a crime as well. But uh, what we do know is when they get to their final hearing, that's probably the number you're talking about in that range where people don't tend their final hearing when, they're actually, when a judge is actually going to make a decision. So you hear a lot of uh, things of people claiming asylum, um, but when they get to that final stage, only about 10 to 15 percent are actually granted asylum for an immigration judge. So there's about an 85 percent denial rate. So in other words, instead of being denied, they disappear. Yes. What are the chances of finding those people again and deporting them? Um, it, it makes our job difficult. Uh, these are people that are not, uh, don't have valid uh, U.S. identification. They're not registering cars. They're generally not homeowners. They're assuming uh, other names, sometimes fake, sometimes other identities. So it makes uh, it harder to find people that are trying to hide in the shadows. Although our officers are well trained and we have good success, it takes longer than it would down to track down a U.S. citizen. Let's talk about the children. Um, what you just described at the top of the program is that the children are basically being used almost as human shields for people coming here illegally. I would say they're, they're being utilized for release. 
Um, I don't know that I would classify as human shield, but a high likelihood that uh, I'll be released quickly into the United States, or even if I go to a family residential center that ICE runs, I'll only be up there for 20 days and, and ultimately be released to, to get to the final destination of where they want to go. How many of these kids have any connection, familial connection, with the people coming across if they're young men? Um, well, when they come across, generally they don't have identification documents, birth certificates. They're making the claim that this is their child. Um, you know, the apprehending agency, which is generally Customs and Border Protection, is making that determination if they're a family or not. We've seen cases when they've come to ICE custody that they were not, and we've investigated that. I would say it's, it's rare, but it happens. Uh, the majority, we believe that they are actually connected, uh, our true mom and uh, uh, mother and father but we're not 100% certain. When the president calls it a crisis, do you agree with that? It's absolutely a crisis. Uh, the, the, this number of families coming over the border is, is just exploiting the loophole in the system, uh, knowing that we can't hold uh, children for very long, and thus the reason that uh, parents are bringing their children with them to the United States. Now, you work for the administration. I mean, the, the president is, is in ex by extension, your boss, right? Uh, by extension, yes, the president is, is, is our boss. So do you have to parrot his take on immigration? Or is this your opinion that it's a crisis? <clears throat> it's my opinion it's a crisis. It's not uh, pairing with anyone that's doing this job of 21 years. I've seen uh, the system be overwhelmed. My officers are working many hours with the limited resources we have. We're having to pull some of our resources that are normally out looking for fugitive criminal aliens that are in the communities in Phoenix, in Tucson, in Flagstaff, uh, to come to the office to release families. So uh, public safety is being affected. Uh, Mark Morgan, a career FBI official who served as a Border Patrol chief for the Obama administration, told Fox uh, News on Thursday that the U.S.-Mexico border is undeniably in a state of crisis. He's agreeing with you. Is this a uniform opinion right now through people who, who do this for a living? I think immigration officials that are, are working uh, on the southwest border are seeing it in California, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas, that the numbers are up across the board. Um, our secretary is citing numbers that this is the highest number it's been in 10 years. So there's no denying the statistics. It's why you're seeing more people uh, at a Greyhound bus station, for instance, because right. of, you know, uh, more people are coming than normally have in the past. Let me ask you about that, and we'll show the video of the Greyhound bus. I think that, that got people's attention um, in Phoenix when they started seeing this, kind of people dropped off the Greyhound bus station. Why the Greyhound bus station? Is it because they're heading somewhere outside of Phoenix? They're leaving town, going elsewhere? So let, let me give you the context of it first. Uh, first of all, you know, everyone coming in through Arizona uh, that's crossing illegally, about 90% of them are from the country of Guatemala. I'm talking specifically families. Um, so when ICE makes a decision that there's no capacity, no bed space for them, and they're going to be released, we serve them release paperwork. We tell them their conditions of release, that they have to check in with an ICE office in seven days. They have to attend their court hearing. How many do that? How many check in? Uh, the, the first check in, I would say a high percentage of them do. Uh, they want to stay off the radar, they don't want to be subject to being rearrested. It's really when they go into the court hearing where you see some of the compliance check off. So they know that if they check in, they're following the conditions, they're not, they're not going to be in violation of their release. One of the things that caught my attention, um, we had 10.7 million right now, this is according to Pew Research Center, 10.7 million is the estimate of unauthorized immigrants living in the U.S. This is a 2016 number, down from a peak of 12.2 million in 2007, and it's the lowest since 2004. People here illegally living in the United States. But when you talk about a crisis, you're talking about specifically this Central American wave, right? Yes. Not necessarily people who are in the interior. This is the, the wave that's hit the, hit the border. I'm talking about the wave that's currently coming across every day and overwhelming the system. I know, you know, there's multiple estimates out there, and there's no way for, for me to validate mm -hmm. that number, but I can, you know, I know the facts of what we are processing every day that is coming through the borders here in Arizona. Is, is it true that some of this is to create a diversion for illegal narcotics, that when you have a flood of people 
coming to the border, say it's a group of 250, you've got to be concerned with that when it happens, and then the smugglers are doing an end run and moving drugs and narcotics across another point of the border. Uh, you know, I can't speak on half of the Border Patrol who's actually seen that, uh, but I can tell you in my experience there is diversions just like that because that takes resources to a central point, especially when they're apprehending 100 people, and if they're taking people off the line, something may be going on five miles down the road to, to get something like narcotics through the border. We've just gone through a major debate between the President and Congress on barriers, borders, border walls. Does that stuff work? Does it help you do your job? Uh, again, that would be kind of the Border Patrol's purview. I can tell you in my experience, it has uh, proven to control the border better, um, that you can slow down traffic, you can divert it to areas where you have more resources. So I think it's beneficial. You worked in El Paso, right? I worked in Calexico for the, in the Border Patrol. Okay. Can you describe what, how it's changed over 21 years, what you've seen, or is it Groundhog Day? That this is just is the, it is the way it is. It's definitely changed. Uh, when I worked there, that was one of the busiest sectors uh, at that time. Uh, we primarily saw only Mexican nationals be apprehended, and it was primarily males, that there was very little females coming across the border. There was definitely no families, very small numbers of unaccompanied children. The dynamic has changed. Now the majority of people that are crossing the border are families. So that's, that's kind of been a huge change in, in, in crossings. In your budget, 2019 budget, um, Immigration and Customs Enforcement has asked for um, eight point, almost nine billion um, in its budget. How much of this is needed to try to build shelters, to try to better help the people who come across and not just release them into the interior? Well, that funding request is really for detention beds to be able to house people to go through the entire system uh, to conclusion. Uh, so those monies are not for shelters for people to release, but for detention beds, whether they're adults or families. Right now, the constraint ICE faces is the floor sediment, where we can only detain those families for up to 20 days. If they're in holding rooms, like in the Border Patrol or ICE custody, they can only be there for three days. And since we're up against that three-day window, that's why we're seeing more people released uh, because of the higher volumes. Okay, so this explains the the Greyhound bus drops, right? So You've run out of places for these people to go. Churches are overwhelmed. Social the, service agencies are overwhelmed. Right, the faith-based organizations are, are overwhelmed. They don't have the capacity with, that they once did because of the numbers. Uh, but I wanna make it very clear that uh, the individual house, the head of household, the family member, the adult, the mother, the father, is given a choice of what they wanna do once ICE decides to release them. So that choice is, do you wanna walk out the front door? We'll, we'll, walk you out the front door. If there's a, a non-governmental organization that's willing to accept you, would you like a ride to that location? Uh, if there's not, would you like a ride to the bus station? So all three of those options are given and ultimately the head of household decides w if they want a ride to an NGO shelter or, or to a bus station. Henry, you, were, you are a Latino man. Can you tell me about the doing this job as a Latino man is it, a, is it a difficult thing from the heart to, to watch all this stuff and be in the enforcement side of it? It's, it's a job that I'm proud to do. I took an oath to, to serve the country and, and to uphold the laws of the United States. As of all of my officers have done, we do our job professionally, with compassion, and we treat everyone, whether they're a criminal or not, with respect. So I'm, I'm proud to lead the Phoenix field office and the employees that do the work that we're talking about. I gotta say, as a personal side, uh, I've been out with you guys m many times with Border Patrol, uh, Customs and Border Protection, flying in the Black Hawk on the border. I was really struck by the level of compassion and uh, care given to the people who enter the country illegally. I was frankly stunned. I didn't expect, I didn't expect that. Absolutely, and the public probably doesn't. I think that whether you're in the Border Patrol or ICE, we're trained professionals. We're doing the job to the best of our ability, but also with safety in mind. And, you know, these are human beings, and we treat them as such. Thank you. Good to see you, Director. Thank you. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Coming up next on Newsmaker Saturday, Tom O'Halloran, a guy who was once a Republican, now a Democrat. He's in the U.S. House of Representatives out of Arizona District 1, and somehow he's tried to thread the needle in a district basically split between Republicans and Democrats. 
how he does it, and he's facing a challenger in the Democratic primary. Tom O'Halloran coming up next on Newsmaker Saturday. Back on Newsmaker Saturday with, uh, we're pleased to have with us Democratic Congressman from District 1 in Arizona, Tom O'Halloran. This is a district that runs from Utah right down to the outskirts of Tucson. It's a huge district, kind of an inverted C, pulling in Flagstaff, parts of Pinal County. You can see one there in blue. Look at all that cluster of all those uh, urban districts, eight, seven, six, nine, five. But one is one of the largest, the 10th largest, I believe, in the country. Tom O'Halloran, our guest. Earlier in the program, I had on the Phoenix director of ICE talking about this situation with Central Americans. I asked him directly, do we have a crisis? And he said, yes, we do. Oh, we, we, the Central American countries have a crisis, therefore the hemisphere has a crisis. Uh, we have to address uh, those issues uh, from a multitude of, uh, of, of uh, ways of dealing with that. Uh, one of them is to be more proactive down there to try to, uh, to make sure that the people aren't coming up here because they're fleeing a country that's authoritative. So you there, think we should be doing more in terms of foreign aid to those countries? Most definitely. I, it's more, much cheaper for us to do that than to have many of the, uh, these people coming Is up there, there and losing their home. Can you also. foreign aid your way out of this? No. No, we have to secure our borders. We have to have a comprehensive uh, immigration approach across the entire spectrum, just like uh, Senator McCain and Senator Kyle did back in uh, 2013. I want to hold on this shot for a minute. Congressman, does this stuff make sense to you when you see these pictures? I mean, to, to any ra rational person, does this kind of, kind of ad hoc immigration make sense? No, that's why comprehensive reform has to be done. Well, what does that mean? I've heard that it for means 20 we years. It means we the visa issue, which was done in 2013 but never passed because it wasn't brought to the floor in the House. It, it means identifying clearly how we use the options of, of foreign aid to help stem these types of tides. It means that we secure the border in a multitude of ways. It means that we actually try to find a way of, of hiring the 3,000 Border Patrol people that we have authority to hire but can't find them. Uh, we have to stem the tide of people we're losing and find more people to get on that border. 3,000 people are significant and we don't have enough people on There's the been a big debate about barriers and border wall. I mean, everybody, anybody who really understands this issue knows you cannot build a contiguous wall. It, it can't be done because it makes no sense in places like the Rio Grande where it's meandering all over the place. It makes no sense. There are places where you can't build it because of sovereignty issues with Native Americans. Tejano. Okay, exactly, in Arizona. But do barriers work? They work when they're strategically placed in a position that will allow that. Uh, we have some, we've, we have better barriers all along the border. Uh, and some of those locations it works and some of it doesn't. Uh, what we don't have is a roadway along the entire border to be able to respond uh, mm -hmm. to incursions. What we don't have is the amount of personnel that's needed and the technology. I, I mean, we can see people coming in now 10 miles away and we can look them at, at them where they're going in our country 10 more miles. If we can respond quickly enough, we can, we can take care of those. So that means more agents. Well, we have and to, maybe more barriers. We to have funnel. approval for 3,000 of them. We, right. we, we just put in almost $3 billion over the last two budgets to address border security over and above the normal uh, budgets that they had. Did you think that the money that Congress allocated was enough for border barriers in this budget? I can't answer that question because nobody sent to me a, 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 a comprehensive plan on what, where they'd be going. Uh, what what they look like, how we, what our response time is, uh, how many personnel we need to respond to incursions over the fence. You can see what a fence alone is not the issue. I mean, people know how to climb these fences. Uh, th there's ways of getting around. It ar slows them down, though. That's what Customs and Border Protection will tell you. It slows it, it them does. down enough so they can respond. If they can get there. But yeah. obviously they can't get there all the time. You are facing, you have found in a district, uh, District 1, um, is slightly Democrat, ever so slightly, about a 25,000 vote margin, I believe, is Democrat over Republican in CD1. You have found this kind of way to thread the needle. You were a former Republican in the Arizona legislature. You've switched parties. You've kind of found a sweet spot there. And now you are getting challenged from the left by a former Flagstaff City Councilwoman, Eva Pizzova. She's 41 years old. She came to the United States from Slovakia in 2000, became a U.S. citizen in 2007. She supports a new Green Deal 
universal health care, tuition-free college, indigenous people's rights, meaningful climate change action, no more wars, women's reproductive health and workers' rights. You're getting flanked from the left on, on, in your district. Well, I'm getting, uh, somebody wants to take my seat or the seat of the people of, of Congressional District 1. We've been very effective. Uh, I will run on my record. Uh, some of those issues are, are things that I, I'm very concerned about, but you just want to look at it in a different way, in a different light. You can't do all that. And, and, uh, and tell the American people you can do it in 10 years. You, you, you have to have a plan, and we'll have a debate on that. She has all the right in the world to run. Uh, that's, what, that's what America's right. about. And, and I'd love to have her on the program, and, and we will um, at, at some point. I was just, I was surprised, and the, the DCCC, that, the party, the frontline program designed to help provide Democratic members of Congress support, they need to win re-election. You're one of 44 members who were identified that they are helping. So they have made, they have bet on their horse and it's you. Well, they know me, they know my record, they know what I can get done. I, I've had a very good two years uh, for everybody in our district. Let me, let me run video of um, uh, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez. I, I wanna get your, I wanna get your take on how that is shaping the party. She's gotten a lot of attention, obviously. She's a rising star, um, kind of crafted the, the new Green Deal. What do you make of this that some call a real lurch left of the Democrat Party? Well, the reality is that uh, the New Dems, I'm a, a New Dem, it's more, a more moderate faction in the party. Uh, I won't run away from that either. Uh, but the, the bottom line is they've gone to the low 70s in membership to over 100. Uh, the Blue Dogs, uh, I'm a co-chair of the Blue Dogs. Uh, we've gone from 17 members. Conservative to Democrats. Conservative Democrats. I would say moderate. I wouldn't okay. call. We're conservative on national defense and, and some of the business issues of America. Uh, the social issues, we don't even discuss that much because that's not what we're about. But we went from 17 to 27. The, the, the amount of moderates that came in, that's why there's 44 members uh, of the DCCC uh, that are, are frontline candidates. Mm -hmm. These are the districts they came from. They so came what from you're saying districts. is the media is focusing on, on people like Ocasio-Cortez, right. but you're saying the party really hasn't lurched tremendously to the left. You don't believe. I don't believe so at all. That doesn't get reported. Well, uh, that, that's, I, I guess people like me don't, don't, <laughs> don't sell, sell newspapers. You know? <laughs> I just kind of go through public policy issues and try to work on them from a... Uh, a position of uh, bringing people together and providing leadership. Okay, you talk about being a blue dog. Let me run video. This was from September of last year. Um, October, pardon me. It was a few weeks before the election. Mm -hmm. President Trump comes out to Luke Air Force Base. Right. There is one Democrat there to meet with him at a round table. And we'll show you the video. It's you. Well, it's, it's me because I have to be there because Arizona's economy is dependent on, uh, partially on defense. And my job is to help the people of all of Arizona and Congressional District 1 have jobs. And I'm not going to run away from uh, the issue because the president is not well liked. The people at that table, in, 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 so by some, the people at that table represented the defense industry of Arizona. You know, we're, so uh, you felt you needed to be there. I have an obligation Forget to be there. Forget the fact that he's a Republican president who's a lightning rod within your party. I have, I have a job to do, and that's protect the economy of Arizona as much as I can and to come together with people to do that. Uh, it's about jobs. I'd rather have a person and a family have a job, uh, be able to sit at the kitchen table, not worry about their future. Ten seconds. Can you work with the president? I can work with anybody as long as they're going to be willing to uh, work in a way that's uh, based on fact. Good to see you. <laughs> Thanks Tom a lot, Howard, John. Congressman from District 1 in Arizona. We're back here in a minute on Newsmakers Saturday. Uh, thanks again to Henry Lucero, the Phoenix director of ICE, and Representative Tom O'Halloran from District 1 in Northern Arizona. You can reach me, and I'd love to hear from you, on my social platforms, Facebook, John Hook, Fox 10, Twitter, John Hook, Fox 10, and we will see you next week on Newsmaker Saturday.